following program on Other Than a 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Therna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The blurry lines of freedom. Today's conversation in this nation is dominated by the need to punish several individuals who made blasphemous statements against Lord Buddha. However, a bigger crisis is brewing underneath without the attention of many. Could local debt restructuring lead to another crisis? Will Sri Lanka get the second tranche of its IMF loan due to the inability to get all creditors to take a principal cut from their debt? questions that need answers, but are completely overshadowed by other subjects. For insights and analysis, tonight I will speak to Venerable Professor Madhavuta Abethi Satero, Economics Professor at the University of Glasgow, Professor William Cockshot, Minister of Justice Dr. Vichitasa Rajapaksa, State Minister of Investment Promotion Dilum Amunugama, Economic Analyst Bram Nicholas, and Zimbabwe's Policy Coordinator General, Economist and former Parliamentarian Eddie Cross. Good evening, I'm Mahish Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone, welcome to the State of the Nation. Thank you very much for your time. We've got a lot to discuss, so let's get down to business. Today, we see many conversations around the topic of freedom of speech. Now, who is raising this issue? This comes after a self-proclaimed comedian made several derogatory comments aimed at laughing at the subject matter for fun. Unfortunately, in this instant, the comedy was at the expense of Buddhism. Now, soon afterwards, the Colombo liberal idiot class was up in arms on their social swift to showcase how their freedom of expression has been curtailed. And later on in the program, I'll dive deep into that subject with Minister of Justice, Vijay, uh, Dr. Vijayadasa Rajabaksa. It is really funny how this selective outrage by the aforementioned idiot class is being displayed. It doesn't help us to keep bringing up the past, but when it's a matter of erudition, we should certainly take the opportunity at it. Now, last year, remember how much of a ruckus the idiot class made concerning the economy. They just wanted one thing. And that was their thing. They said, this is the way to solve the economic crisis. They said, IMF is the only way. They said, money printing by Cabra raised inflation. But now, money printing by Nandala? No hair inflation. When there was any effort to give a different point of view back then, these individuals worked hard to shut them down. When it's against them, then violating freedom of expression is something that they will happily entertain and even go to the lower level of explaining why that type of thinking should be eradicated. That's right. It should be eradicated. That's what they say. Different viewpoints? Nope. Now these individuals who scream freedom of expression don't even understand the true meaning of it. All they understand is garbage fed by their masters to get their agendas up and running. And for all the clowns of the Colombo liberal idiot class, whether you like it or not, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist nation. Our constitution has given Buddhism the foremost place and laws have been drawn accordingly to ensure its citizens do not violate its rightful place. And when it is convenient for you, you do not get the right to violate it, whether you like it or not. Every citizen of this nation should and must abide by the law of the land. Now, if you disagree and need to change that, well, there are options. You can migrate to a country where they serve your dish of freedom of speech. Or do it 
using your voice at the polls, not how it was displayed last year by most of you on July 9th. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. As I said, our current conversations on our nation's uh, economic recovery have been sidelined by shiny objects like uh, a conversation regarding Prophet Jerome, Natasha Indrasuria and Bruno Divakara. However, we as a nation need to get back to fixing our economy. Now, last Thursday night, the President reminded us how much more we need to do uh, while unveiling his roadmap to recovery. <laughs> ඊළඟ අවුරුදු 25 තුල ඉහළ ආදායම් ලබන දියුණු රටක් බවට පත් වෙනවා. ඒ තමයි අපේ අරමුණ. මුල් අවුරුදු 5 න් පසු රට නගා සිටුවීමේ වැඩපිළිවෙල බාර වෙන්නේ ඊළඟ පරම්පරාවටයි. අප ඒ සඳහා තරුණ තරුණියන් සූදානම් කරනවා. පෙළගස් වෙනවා. එනම් අභියෝගයන්ට මූණ දෙමින් 2048 වෙද්දී අපේ මාර්තු භූමිය පූර්ණ සංවර්ධන රටක් බවට පත් කිරීමට තරුණ තරුණියන් උර දෙන බව මට විශ්වාසය. රටේ වගකීම බාරගෙන ඒ ඉලක්ක ළඟා කරගන්නා බව මට විශ්වාසයි. මේ වැඩපිළිවෙල ඔබ අප සැමගේම අනාගතය ගොඩනක් වන වැඩපිළිවෙත. Well that was uh, President Rani Vikramasinghe addressing the nation last week. The road is long and narrow, but we must walk it anyway. So Sri Lanka needs to get its bearings together to ensure that we come out of this. Right now, there are efforts made by the government to hold talks with our creditors to ensure that they will restructure the loans as per the requirement by the IMF. However, we hear from the great point that uh, China is not happy to negotiate its debt in a manner where they have to lower the price of the principal loan, aka to take a haircut on the principal figure. Yes, the president said that a lot of progress was made. Yes, it's also true that the governor of the central bank announced uh, to the public that our reserves are up, the economy is slowly recovering, interest rates uh, have been lowered, and more importantly, inflation is coming down. So, let me ask you this question, is the economy getting on the right track? Do you feel that when you go to buy your daily groceries, is the money you have in your pocket sufficient to last the whole month? We all know the answer is a resounding no. So what does it mean when the government states that everything is back on track, yet we are not feeling it? Remember, during last year, uh, unrest, the liberal clowns of economics uh, were screaming that it's because of inflation that everything is costly. Okay, I hear you. Then as per your theory, the price should come down when inflation comes down, shouldn't it? Let's get Dani Duvitana Masamin, who's at the data board, uh, to clarify uh, why this is. Uh, Dani, good to see you once again. Now, earlier I requested you to find out as to why the cost of living remains high when all indicators, as per the government, shows a trend of dropping. What did you learn? Um, Maisha, I want to explain three things within this specific segment now to answer that question. One thing is to get what the government is saying, we have to understand what they're actually projecting and that is a reduction in the inflation rates. Now that has been the unique selling point for the government for quite some time. You see it was in March 50, uh, over 50 percent, over 35 percent in April and now in May 25 percent. I think even the central bank governor last week was mentioning there is a steady decline in the inflation. So what we expect is that to be reflected within the prices. The second thing I want to explain is, Mahesh, we don't really understand what inflation is, the majority of the people. Inflation is the change in prices or the increase in prices, the rate. It's basically a, a correlation to the acceleration of a vehicle, maybe. That doesn't mean the prices have gone down. Basically to say that we are not seeing deflation in our country. But what we are seeing is that the prices have now reached a high extent and now it's within a plateau. To give you a practical example, Mahesh, if we actually look at the prices from one month ago to today, if the inflation was going down, we are expecting that the prices would have also gone down, but it's actually the opposite. Let me give you three examples. For beans, cabbage and carrot, one month ago, beans was at 300. Today, in the main markets, you see it at 350. 
at one month ago, cabbage was, you could be found at 150, today it's 360. One month ago, carrot could be purchased at 120, and today it's 296. So there is no reduction, though we see last month that there is, a, a, like the inflation has gone down to this month, the prices have actually increased. And interestingly, Mahesh, in outstation, the samba, I think the majority commodity of rice that is being purchased, one year ago, it was actually cheaper than it is right now. Because one year ago, it was close to 200, uh, it, it, it was close to about 219, and now it has increased to, it has increased to uh, exponential level, though that is outstation. Obviously, if you look at the PETA market, it has come down. But we see that it is interesting that this unique selling point, the inflation unique selling point, is actually a false narrative, a false uh, uh, objective, a false sort of uh, point that has been put forward. We can't really understand the economy through it. Why do you think that was the driving force uh, with regard to the conversation we had uh, last year when the economy was being mentioned by especially these liberal clowns? They were continuously saying inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, why do you think that was the narrative that they used? And uh, apparently, are they changing their story now? Yeah, the point was there, Mahesh, they wanted to argue, like you just mentioned, the, the printing of money. And the easiest way to argue that point mm -hmm. is to say, OK, as you print money, there is inflation. Let's leave out all the other indicators, and let's just talk about printing of money and uh, what, what the inflation it's shows. It's being really shrewd, isn't it? Uh, misleading the public is, is exactly what they do all the time. And when their theories, which they uh, have learned from a book or something that they read uh, when they were bored, uh, and then they come back and try to preach to the country. And when that theory doesn't go according to plan because they have no practical knowledge of it, uh, then they keep changing the story once again. Uh, that is something we've been seeing. And I'm waiting for that narrative to change again as we move on. All right, Danidu Tharmas, I'm at the data board as always. Thank you. Now, another area of focus for most of us uh, should be on the local debt restructuring plans, mind you. It's a prerequisite by the IMF to be in their program, at least uh, by the next uh, tranche expected in October of this year. We need to show the IMF that we are in line with the program and that a local debt restructuring is on the cards. However, it's more challenging than you think. If we restructure local debt held by most local banks, they will have to find new capital to cover the costs. So where are they going to find that? They cannot borrow more money. Hence, they will remove the capital or the profit they already have from the market to cover the losses, meaning less money for borrowing, which will clearly impact the business sector. Let's get more on this. And for that, joining me now is economic analyst Bram Nicholas. Bram, good to see you. Thank you very much for being here. Now, uh, do tell us why many are cautious about local debt restructuring. Is, it re is this really risky for Sri Lanka's economy? Uh, thank you, Mahesh, for having me on. I think the, the first issue uh, that I have is the framing of the problem itself. Because many uh, people in the financial media and in government are calling this a general debt crisis or a general debt problem. Uh, but I see it mainly as an external debt problem. After all, Sri Lanka did default on its external debt and not on its domestic debt. And recognizing that as the core problem is for me where it starts because the policies that the government should adopt going forward uh, should be primarily focused on earning the foreign exchange that is required to pay off that foreign debt and to service it. But instead, I'm seeing a lot of policies put forward by the government that are focused on fiscal consolidation and you know, now proposing to restructure domestic debt, which for me is really missing uh, the main problem. And so there are examples, right? Like, uh, for instance, that they uh, have decided to raise taxes. Now, generally, I uh, was uh, in favor of that because I think that, you know, it was clear to everyone that the tax base was much too low and compared to other countries, uh, developing countries, that is, uh, it was too low to be sustained. So no problem there. but the, the added problem was that taxes were also raised on exporters. And those are the one sector 
that the government should be promoting in every way it can. Because, I say it again, it's an external debt problem, not necessarily a domestic debt problem. Yeah, understood, uh, Bram. Uh, now, if the government uh, moved towards uh, making domestic debt restructuring happen, let's hypothetically think, what are the key areas uh, of impact? The key areas to be impacted by a potential domestic debt restructuring uh, are really um, primarily the banking sector. So this issue has been raised by uh, members of the banking community and quite rightly so because restructuring domestic debt has a lot of negative consequences for the bank's uh, balance sheets. And that, uh, of course, starts questioning whether they're uh, still solvent. And that is just one of the issues. But the other major issue there is that when domestic debt is restructured, and it doesn't matter if that is a haircut on the capital value or a haircut on the interest payments, or even an extension of maturity, it will all impact the value of whoever is holding those securities, right? And that, in the case of the banks, but also the pension funds in Sri Lanka, is going to have quite a bit of a negative impact because the pension funds will have less to pay out to everyone that has saved with them. Uh, but there's actually one other problem that might be even more fundamental than the other problems is that when, uh, as the government seems to be leaning towards, is thinking about restructuring short-term debt, you start messing around with what is the core of, uh, let's say, liquidity management in the economy. So let's say the government uh, extends some maturity on uh, treasury bills or even does a haircut on those treasury bills, it's going to impact the value of assets that are usually used in crucial liquidity management like the repo market. Okay, so that is, is one of the negative consequences that I see for the financial system. Another is that generally you're going to start um, introducing the concept of the local government being able to default on local government debt. Now that rarely happens in a country because it's so important that everyone sees the government's, uh, government securities as the safe asset. And that then serves, so the rate on that safe asset serves as the benchmark for all other rates in the economy. So if you now start introducing the concept that that is no longer the safe asset and that in fact the government can default on its domestic debt, then we have to start wondering what now is going to be the benchmark rate for all asset valuations in the economy. And that... Uh, is a major impact. All right, uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you. That was economic analyst Bram Nicholas. Let's take a short break upon our return. Uh, we'll speak to author and economic professor from the University of Glasgow as to why liberal economists are so much pushing for erroneous policies that are harmful to nations. This is the State of the Nation back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. And there is an ideology that's circulating in developing countries that has become the root of all problems. It did its damage in the West back in the day. The financial meltdown of 2007-8, the offshoring of wealth and power, of which the Panama, Panama Papers offer us merely a glimpse, um, the slow collapse of public health and education sectors, Resurgence of child poverty, the epidemic of loneliness, the collapse of ecosystems and the rise of hate speech, to name a few. But we responded to these crises as if they emerged in isolation, apparently unaware that they have all been either catalyst or exacerbated by the same coherent philosophy, a philosophy that has or had no name. What greater power can there be to operate namelessly? So now it has a name and it's called neoliberalism. For many years, this doctrine operated namelessly and thought it was progressive to give way to its ideology. Later people worldwide began to realize that it was not a solution, but more so the root of all problems. In Sri Lanka too, most economic policies that have let us down have stemmed from this thinking. Neoliberalism seems good on paper, but never in the real world. It started with the open economy in the 70s here in Sri Lanka, and now we suffer from that moronic ideology. Sadly, our leaders have been fooled to the level that they still think it is the solution. Fake think tanks funded by these very masters of that ideology continue to promote that uh, BS in this country. While they will never pay for its errors, instead it will be you and me. Let's put some context uh, into this conversation. Join me now via Zoom from Glasgow, Scotland. He is pro a former professor of economics at the University of Glasgow and author Professor William Paul Cockshot. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for being here. I appreciate your time. Now, we have seen a rise in neoliberal thinking in economics, uh, in the economic space in recent times. I want to ask you, uh, what exactly has been the impact of this, especially on emerging economies like Sri Lanka? Yes, Mahesh, that's a good question. It, it goes right back to the coup against Allende in the 1970s, when you had a government that was intent on a different course of development in Chile, and the US organized a coup against it and put in place a military dictator who followed the economic doctrines of the Chicago School and imposed drastic reductions in living standards in Chile in response to defend the interests of American business in Chile. It then became a, a general doctrine that was called the Washington Consensus and wasn't necessarily imposed by military means as it had been in Chile, but was imposed by the international institutions that Washington controls, um, primarily the IMF, but also the World Bank. And the general aim of all these policies has to be to reduce the income and living standards of the great mass of the people in those countries where it took control in order to divert money either to American business or indirectly to the banking sector, the, the big international finance organizations. That, that's the essence of what neoliberal policy stands to. It's financial capital rather than industrial capital. Indeed, uh, Professor. Now, how did the banking crisis, which uh, we saw in the United States, uh, affect developing countries such as Sri Lanka and this part of the world? Well, it, it's due to the, the hollowing out of the productive economy in the United States, which has led to the US running a huge trade deficit, which has amounted to a form of tribute, which the US has been able to impose on the rest of the world due to its um, position as the world currency, the dollar's position as the world currency. Now, with the rise of an alternative model, the Peking model, you see that 
the US is ceding its position as the leading economy in the world. It is no longer the world's main manufacturing center. And as a result, the cost of borrowing for the United States to maintain its deficit is rising, especially as a consequence of the US and Europe seizing Russian dollar assets. This has removed the trustworthiness of the American banking system. And in order to attract funds, they have to raise the interest rate. And most US, a large part of the US banking system had assets which were in the form of treasury bills, US treasury bills. As the, the interest rate rose, they fell in value and the banks can no longer have sufficient reserves. Now, in the short term, this is likely to re lead to a rise in dollar interest rates, but this is a transitional, we're in a transitional phase between the, the dominance of the dollar as world currency and the supplanting of the dollar of world currency. And this is a period of instability between these two eras. So it's difficult to predict the exact impact of that, but it's probable that it will give greater freedom to developing countries than existed under the dollar hegemony. Professor, uh, we are looking for a lot of solution as a nation. Now, what key models do you suggest that a country like Sri Lanka should uh, follow to gain reasonable development moving forward after this economic crisis? Well, you, you really have to look at why China succeeded so well or why Vietnam has succeeded. They basically succeeded because they had the kind of radical revolution that only occurred in the past in France and Russia. They had a system in which they undermined the revenues of the old landowning classes. That is absolutely the key thing the Chinese did. They nationalized the land. This enabled the state to gain control of the revenues which formerly were wasted. This is the whole point of Adam Smith's classical economics, that the landowning class is unproductive and prevents the development of an economy. And what the Chinese did is they got rid of that landowning class and ensured that the surplus product of the Chinese economy went into reinvestment. They achieved their astonishing levels of growth because during, say, 10, 15 years ago, they were reinvesting 45% of GDP. If you reinvest 45% of GDP, as the Chinese were doing, or as the Soviets were doing in the 1930s, then you can achieve what appears a miraculous performance. But it's absolutely necessary that the state is able to control and redirect the whole economic surplus towards accumulation rather than luxury consumption. That is absolutely the essence. Makes a lot of sense. Well, we have to leave it at that. Thank you. That was a former professor of economics at the University of Glasgow and author, Professor William Paul Cockshot. A short break now. When we return, Sri Lanka's investment opportunities. Is it bleak? State Minister of Investment Promotion, William Mamalakaman, will join me shortly. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. everyone to the state of the nation now with Sri Lanka defaulting thanks to the leadership of the current governor of the central bank our investment opportunities if we had any prior to the default went belly up 
Uh, promising business ventures are still eyeing Sri Lanka, especially from China and the Global East. The West seems to be broke and full of problems. Although the United States ambassador act as if she will do her very best to help Sri Lanka get back on track, direct investments from the United States in recent times have been very low. Let's get some insight into this and for that joining me now is the State Minister of in Investment Promotion, Dilum Amunukuma. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Appreciate it. Now, what is Sri Lanka's potential in terms of investment? Have we managed to make Sri Lanka a lucrative business destination after the whole uh, economic debacle of last year? Well, Mahesh, we are working on it uh, right now. There are certain changes. Uh, the President has the Minister of Investment also that he wants to uh, make, especially with the rules and the regulations. So, uh, right now, uh, we have appointed an oversight committee uh, and we are waiting for we are waiting for their report to be presented, where we will be coming up with a comprehensive investment law which will uh, facilitate investors and also encourage investors, to, uh, especially the investors who have already invested, will uh, be entitled to certain uh, concessions and also it will be quite attractive for new investors coming in. So uh, this is the long term plan. Uh, we are hoping that the oversight committee will uh, have the report out in a couple of months and maybe somewhere end of this year or beginning of 2024, we can start off with the new rules. Minister, how is your ministry promoting Port City? I understand that it falls under another jurisdiction, but still, there's a prime opportunity to bring lucrative business to the country. Yeah, now Port City, we are working on the regulations. Most of the regulations have been passed in Parliament and gazetted. Uh, the most essential regulation was the BSI, that is the Business of Strategic Importance, which is the regulation which will state what the financial operation will look like within the port city. So that includes the concessions given to them, uh, the financial rules and regulations like offshore banking, gaming and all that. So uh, we have about 16, 17 investors who have already engaged with the port city uh, commission uh, who are pending approval of this BSI. So uh, it has been approved in cabinet and it's with the legal draftsman. Once it's out, it will be in parliament and then gazetted. So then we can have the investors uh, physically engaging uh, in the port city. And we are pushing hard because this is the new financial city that we want to develop uh, in Colombo. Of course, there won't be any manufacturing within that, but it will be all uh, financial and business activity in the port city. Uh, construction is on schedule. We have uh, discussed and we have funded the power, water and sewerage uh, connections. Uh, the Czech company is doing a good job uh, on uh, executing whatever the contract they have taken over. So uh, it's very positive, it's very positive and we have uh, so many uh, investors and companies, especially uh, top class uh, businesses in the world who want to have their uh, maybe their headquarter or their back office in Port City. Indeed understood. All right, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the State Minister of Investment Promotion, Dilim Abunukola. A short break now. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. everyone to the state of the nation nowadays with Jerome Natasha and Bruno taking uh, much of the conversation space on social media the dishonest liberals have a problem hmm what could that be apparently just like I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the program they are up in arms about freedom of speech they say individuals like Natasha and Bruno were vilified for their expression the freedom of expression was curtailed. Why? Because the Buddhist community didn't like what they said, so they punished them. That's what they say. 
It's incredibly laughable how the Risanas Colombo liberal idiot class operates. Now, last year, when this show came under fire, why? Well, because they didn't like what I said about their little beach party down Golf is Green. Remember how they were outraged about that? Now, we all know it was not just a beach party with all the information that's coming out. It's, it was, in fact, a bigger scheme executed by a few to bring disrepute and discredit to this nation, piggybacking on a real crisis that you and I faced. Now, the question is, should you have freedom of speech or the freedom of expression to say what you want? I agree, you indeed should. It's a fundamental right. If any entity is trying to take that away, that's wrong. So the question becomes, who's trying to take away this freedom of speech? Well, the Colombo liberal idiot class uh, was very swift to point their fingers at the Buddhist fellowship. So does Buddhism as a philosophy forbids criticism about the religion? I pose that question to Venerable Professor Maldaguda Abed de Satero. Watch. Buddhism is a religion that supports free thinking. There is no obstacle to criticize or critical thinking in Buddhism. Kalama Sutra is the best example of this. Buddha points out to get rid of doubt, not to keep doubt and believe. In short, the Buddha provides the opportunity to question even himself. That is not the problem here. Some use the tolerance of the Buddhist to abuse Buddhism. They consider our superiority as timidity. There is no doubt anywhere in doctrine. Some literary matters are used by them to insult Buddhism. It hurts Buddhists. By this, they are trying to confuse the society. The social confusion is an opportunity for the country's politician to come to power and protect their power. And also, there are foreign enemies of us. They also use these opportunities for their aims and objectives. Well, that was uh, Venerable Professor Madhaguda Abeti Satero. Well, now, the dishonest two-faced Colombo liberal idiot class is on a quest to tell the world that apparently Sri Lanka has no freedom of speech. Is that the case? And more so are the laws regarding freedom of speech in Sri Lanka too blurry for modern society? Joining me now is the Minister of Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reforms, Dr. Vijay Dasar Rajpaksa. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Appreciate your time. Uh, well, Minister, there is an attempt by these uh, Colombo liberals to showcase a narrative to the world saying that Sri Lanka doesn't have the freedom of speech. They do this when it is very convenient for them. Earlier, they didn't have the decency nor the ability to respect the views of others. But now, when their own are in uh, trouble by violating the law, they want to pitch this narrative of lack of freedom of speech in Sri Lanka. So, as Sri Lanka's Justice Minister explained to us, what Sri Lanka upholds as free, uh, freedom of speech and how far can we stretch it? Uh, Mahesh, the freedom of speech and expression, including publication, has been guaranteed by Article 41 1A of our Constitution. But it doesn't mean that it is a wild ass freedom where that the, this right could be used uh, just to jeopardize the rights of the other people. That is why constitution itself in article 15 sub article 2 it categorically says the the rights recognized by article 41 14 1a shall be subject to such restrictions as may be prescribed by law in the interest of racial and religious harmony or in relation to parliamentary privilege 
now here it is categorically uh, mentioned in the constitution the freedom is there uh, for expression uh, and speech but still that right could be exercised uh, without jeopardizing the religious harmony uh, and the uh, racial interest of the people and therefore the constitution has given ample authority ample power for the people to exercise their uh, right of expression at the same time in our penal code section 291a uh, categorically provides that any kind of uh, deliberate intention of wounding the religious feelings of any person or any uh, community then it is an offense where a offender could be punished with a with a one year uh, sentence or fine or both then section 291b further says if any uh, deliberation is done with the malicious intention of outrage in the religious feeling of any class of person by words either spoken or written or by visible representation that is also an offense whereas an offender could be punished with an imprisonment of 2 years or fine or with both in addition to that the international convention on civil and political rights the we have enacted to ensure that right by act number 56 of 2007 if somebody uh, disrupt this religious and racial uh, harmony that also treated as an offense whereas the offender could be punished with an imprisonment extending to 10 years and therefore all these rights are there that there won't be any kind of interference with regard to that but the laws of the country has to be respected the law the constitution has to be respected that we are working only within the framework of the constitution and statutory law and therefore that there is no any disturbance or restriction for that freedom but to be exercised uh, in accordance with the law very clear indeed our let's leave it at that thank you very much that was the Minister of Justice Dr Vijay Das of Rajpaksa so let's take a break when we return we'll tell you who prophet Uber Angel is and what he has to do with prophet Jerome this is the state of the nation back in a moment reported on the controversy that surrounded prophet Jerome after he made several blasphemous statements regarding Buddhism this got a massive backlash from the Buddhist community in this country as we all know the self proclaimed prophet Jerome managed to flee to singapore and has uh, and since then has apologized to each and everyone who ha- who was hurt by his statements now in that se- uh, segment last week we talked about another individual a zimbabwean televangelist called prophet uber angel mind you he is a self proclaimed prophet just like prophet jerome the reason reason why we keep bringing up prophet uber angel in this conversation about prophet jerome now a recent investigative documentary by al jazeera exposed how prophet uber angel smuggled zimbabwe's gold out of the country in an elaborate scheme of cleaning black money worldwide watch you want to just get gold the other deals that we normally do with the people like the one we did in dubai where they also want to invest in gold and buy gold maybe send a private jet pick picks up gold every week that's okay no that's okay let's do it bro you know very uh, hundred kilos every week oh they're taking 100 kilos every week okay okay but why how many the next four percent the the getting it at least four percent the world's good yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Stanley is being offered to buy the gold at a 4% discount. They're saying it's very good price. I think you should have said less 3%. <laughs> Definitely. You should have said less 3%. <laughs> it was a mistake in the, in the language that was released. Well, that was a, a small portion uh, from the investigative documentary uh, by Al Jazeera, which is called Gold Mafia. I think uh, right now there are around four episodes of it. You really should watch it. Now, this is not the first scam that uh, Prophet Uber Angel was involved in. His first issue with the law was when he got caught uh, with two passports in 2021. The birth dates on these two passports, one British and one Zimbabwean, are different. Not only that, but there are also questions about Ubit Angel's academic qualifications, with evidence pointing to the fact that some of his degrees are fake. The United States uh, State Department of Justice, uh, through an operation called Gold Seal, flagged Uber Angel's Bachelor of Business Administration degree obtained from St. Regis University as fake. A sting operation uh, Gold Seal busted a massive internet-based business from the city of Spokane in the U.S., selling over 10,000 fake credentials to over 9,500 uh, individuals in 131 countries. And Sri Lanka is included in that. There are apparently four individuals who has taken uh, um, degrees from this fake university. And this university, by dishing out fake uh, uh, degrees, has raked in over $7.3 million. Now, despite this, Uber Angel became a very wealthy individual with various dealings made via multiple businesses. He has several television and radio stations worldwide, and with his flamboyant presence, he managed to infiltrate the political circle of the Zimbabwean government. The current president of Zimbabwe awarded him the presidential envoy and ambassador at large for the country of Zimbabwe to Europe and the Americas, allowing him to engage in uh, several more shady dealings. Uber Angel has been to Sri Lanka several times at the invitation of Prophet Jerome. It needs to be clear, uh, cl clarified rather, whether there was any support from Uber Angel himself financially to Prophet Jerome. Despite there, ha uh, there have been, been no concrete evidence thus far, many on social media began to question how Prophet Jerome's newfound wealth, where he effect, uh, erected a massive building titled Miracle Dome, very close to the airport, came from. On one of his visits to Sri Lanka, Prophet Uber Angel engaged in this thing called miracle money scam, making money appear in people's wallet. I don't know. Uh, some did uh, with uh, 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 reloads on your phone and some did with money. So what they do is they basically say, by the power of God, I'm going to put money into your wallet and voila, the money appears or reloads appear on your phone. Now later, a person who took part in that event wrote on his Facebook page uh, saying that the whole thing was arranged as they have collected the bank account details of several members before the service and transferred the funds during the service. Obviously, now, it is very evident when you look at those entire services that was uh, taking place. Anyhow, in March of this year, I'll, um, the documentary which we just showed, um, showed that Uber Angel was uh, abusing his diplomatic privileges to run a global money laundering operation. The operation involves black money being funneled to Zimbabwe through Angel and traded for gold from mines of Zimbabwe, the gold which uh, could then be sold again for clean money. Now, soon after the documentary, the Zimbabwean government stripped Uber Angel of all the titles provided by the president and an active investigation is currently underway. Not only uh, there, but here also it's the same. Let's get uh, more insight into this. Uh, joining me now from Harare, Zimbabwe, is Zimbabwe's Policy Coordinator General, uh, former parliamentarian and economist Eddie Cross. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for being here. Really appreciate it. Now, what exactly are you all trying to do uh, in terms of uh, this investigation? It looks like Uber Angel has been using state assets, uh, Zimbabwean state assets, for personal benefit. What does the Zimbabwean government think about this? Mahesh, this matter has been receiving <clears throat> a high-level attention since the Al Jazeera disclosures. And I think what the government was concerned about here was the brashness of the whole thing and his claims to have direct access to the president and to have the 
have the senior members of the Zimbabwean government involved in what he was doing. And I think that he was very foolish uh, to make those statements because um, a, commission, a, a committee has been formed inside the cabinet to examine what was, what was going on. And they have decided to take fairly strong action against the individuals who were most prominent in the Al Jazeera disclosures. Indeed. Uh, now, uh, Prophet Uber Angel has been to Sri Lanka several times and uh, here he engaged uh, with an individual called Prophet Jerome Fernando. Do you think certain matters need to be investigated in relevance to the shady dealings between these two individuals? And have you discovered, discovered any information about his dealings in Sri Lanka? We were not aware of that. Um, we know that he's been pretending, uh, you know, he's a charlatan. Um, he's by no means a, a good representation of the Christian church. And I think he's used the church as a, as a cover. Um, and I think that he, it's very exploitative. And, uh, and I think that uh, although that's not really an issue that's been of concern to the Zimbabwean government, I think it's something that we as, as citizens of Zimbabwe should actually be, be concerned. And he's clearly built a network across the world, which he is using, um, and is using this as a cover for what he's actually been doing. But what he's been doing is illegal, and it's, uh, and in fact, it's exploitive. Indeed. Uh, all right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. That was Zimbabwe's Policy Coordinator General and Economist. Uh, and former parliamentarian Eddie Cross. A short break now. I'll be back with the close. This time last year, we as a society let chaos reign and dictate our country's governing structures. It was regrettable to say the least. Today we are trying to turn a new page in our country, a new page with the same old tricks and the same old tricksters. Though the president, alongside his loyal followers, are attempting to pin the blame on the non-liberalization of the economy over the years, the problem runs far deeper than that. Do you really think our public service is ready to optimize to a level to cut down on waste and be more productive? The same goes to the private sector. Do we really have an objective of common growth or is it primarily based on finding what's best for yourself? I hear the trend of what is best for oneself is found abroad. I question this because it will only matter if the head of state changes his thinking. Suppose we are willing to see the change within ourselves and make an honest push to do something different. How would that translate to the betterment of each and every one of us? One key thing I wish to highlight is this. We are currently following uh, thought leaders of the West. We are worshipping their institutions like the IMF, the World Bank. Many of us did what we could do to show the country the alternative pathways. Now that idea, alongside uh, anything homegrown, was kicked out. What we need to do right now is to remember. Remember who said to do this and what the results are going to be. On a programming note, make sure you check our State of the Nation podcast out every week. The State of the Nation podcast is available on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. Abba is Johnny. From all of us at Other Derana 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Get Real.